Hello, I'm Bill Guest, and this is Solar Magic, that rare day when the sun, the moon, and the earth come into perfect alignment and provide one of the great natural shows on earth, a total solar eclipse. And opening the program with me is a rooster that you likely just heard in the background. That's our friend Erebus, and you'll get a chance to look at him in just a short while. But right now, I'd like you to look at a man who had us all very anxious over this weekend, the public forecaster here in Winnipeg, Mark Haxley. Mark, yesterday about this time, and there was a suggestion we'd have a heavy cloud cover and we wouldn't see the total eclipse. Now, what happened to blow those clouds away? Well, Bill, as this satellite picture taken at 7.30 this morning shows, there's two systems. The first one moved fairly rapidly into the eastern part of northwestern Ontario, and the second one slowed down somewhat. It's just moving into Manitoba, so there's a large area of clear air, clear space in between the two, which we didn't really expect. And there's some thin cloud across southeastern Manitoba at the present time, but we'll be able to see the sun through that. So that's the reason that uh, we've got clear skies when originally we were anticipating some weather. All right, so as it stands right now, Mark, you're confident we're going to have a pretty good sky for the next hour. I think so. I don't think there's going to be too much trouble. All right, then you enjoy the eclipse along with us. Thanks for coming down, Mark. Good having you here with us. Well, the first uh, part of our stellar show, our exhibition, is already underway. This is what it looks like over Winnipeg as the moon is taking a bite out of the sun, the start of what will lead to that total eclipse of the sun. Now, depending on where you are, the overhead sight will be different. Right now, you'll be seeing less of the sun if you live in the west, and you'll be able to see more of the sun if you live in the east. And by the way, the proper observation of the sun requires some specialized technical knowledge, so if you're not familiar with the proper technique, just uh, stay with us and we'll see to it that you see it all. Well, here with me on our rooftop perch in downtown Winnipeg, we're at the top of the CBC building on 40 Avenue. I have with me Robert Ballantyne, director of the Manitoba Planetarium. And uh, you've been very anxious about this for a long, long, you've been talking about this for months. And uh, how do you feel now that the time has come? Well, I don't think anybody is surprised that the eclipse is right on schedule and looking just the way it should right now. But I am always amazed when it begins. That moon which was invisible in the sky has suddenly shown itself to be there. It's between us and the sun right now. And we live in a very special place, Bill. We live on the planet Earth. And from this point of view, we have a, a moon. <laughs> I love that rooster. We, we have a moon that's just the right size and the right distance away to very neatly and precisely block out the sun. If the moon was any bigger or smaller or farther away or closer to us, it wouldn't do such a perfect job. Well, you know, you can speak about eclipses with confidence, Robert, because this is, is this your fourth or fifth that you're seeing? This, this is number five. Wow. Tell us about some of the other ones you've seen. Well, I've been very lucky. I think we all are today because every time it's a clear day as it is for us right now. <laughs> the last time I didn't see the beginning of the eclipse because the sun was below the horizon. I was at Zanzibar. And, a little uh, warmer than you are today, too. A little bit warmer, and I have even some pictures to show all of you. And Zanzibar is uh, a beautiful place, and we're there under the trees looking out over the Indian Ocean. And as we stood there eventually waiting in the pre-dawn, we were wondering because there were clouds. And clouds are always part of the drama, mm -hmm. because if you have clouds, you're not going to be able to see the eclipse. The fishermen set out in their dows, and eventually the sun appeared. And my gosh, it looked beautiful and strange because it was a a crescent sun. It was rising up through the sky and uh, we worried a great deal about those clouds because we were hoping that it would be able to surmount the clouds and uh, go into totality above the clouds. And that is exactly what happened. We saw the corona and it was a dazzling and beautiful sight, Bill. Well, for a fellow who went to watch the eclipse on Zanzibar, I don't know how you found time to take these marvelous pictures. They're excellent. Well, I enjoyed it. Now, how great is the scope of this eclipse that we're going to see today, uh, Robert? Uh, what's its overall path? Can you describe that to us? Well, most of North America, with the exception of a tiny part of Alaska, is going to be able to see a partial eclipse. Now, this really isn't a very interesting event. It's what we see right now. And that partial eclipse will even extend over to part of the British Isles, France, and a little bit of Spain. But only people who live along the path of totality uh, through the upper part of the United States, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba will be able to see the total eclipse, the event that we are waiting for. Uh, they uh, will see the moon encroach on the sun as we are watching right now, and at the center of the eclipse, the moon will cover the sun and we'll have totality. Well, we're all looking forward to that. Now, here's our plan of attack. Uh, here's how we plan to keep you in touch with, with what's going on here today. In just about 15 minutes time, in 15 minutes, uh, there will be a total eclipse of the sun in the state of Washington, as Robert has suggested. It'll uh, take place well ahead, of course, of the eclipse that we're going to have here in Manitoba. Now, as the sun and the moon and the
the Earth continue to move into perfect alignment, the total eclipse will be visible at various points across the northwestern United States. The path of totality then swings up into Canada, touching the southeastern corner of Saskatchewan, almost all of southern Manitoba, part of northwestern Ontario, just a bit of northern Quebec, and then up through the Arctic. Now, we have a, another camera located at Brandon here in Manitoba. That's 200 kilometers west of Winnipeg. The total eclipse in that area will occur in just about 40 minutes' time. Now, here is the shot from the Brandon camera. And incidentally, it's located on the roof of a building in that city's downtown area. The partial phase of the eclipse has been, under, eclipse has been underway in that area for about 25 minutes now. Now, our sky shot camera here in Winnipeg has this kind of a view to offer us. The partial eclipse in this area hasn't progressed quite as far as it has in Brandon, and of course that's evident in that picture. Now there is another camera location at Bel Air. Now Bel Air is about 60 kilometers north of Winnipeg, and this is the picture that Bel Air is sending back to us. And there are two more cameras high above the Earth. One of them is aboard a Canadian Forces Hercules aircraft. We hope to get a first-rate picture of the eclipse from that when totality occurs. And our second flying camera today uh, is aboard a Learjet with newsman Jake O'Donnell. And uh, the picture it gets for us will be recorded, and we'll receive those when the airplane gets back to Earth again. And I think we'll be able to talk with Jake just a little later on. And I've just been given a signal that indicates we may not, may not be hearing from the Hercules. We may not get a, a picture from that. It's sort of touch and go. But uh, let's hope we can. Well, on a nearby rooftop location, one of the highest in downtown Winnipeg, we have uh, still another camera, and its purpose is to show just what happens on Earth when the moon completely covers the sun. Now, that's a question I want to ask you about, Robert. Uh, there's a lot of talk about some sudden changes that come about uh, during those few minutes of a total eclipse. Now, what exactly are they? Well, it's the moment leading up to totality that the drama really begins to, to pick up pace. We will see the sun whittle down until there's nothing but a little tiny sliver in the sky. And then following that, there will be a, what they call a diamond ring. The sun will look like a brilliant star in the sky, still dangerous to look at. It's not the time to begin looking. But uh, the moon will just about be over the sun. At that time, the shadow of the moon will be rushing towards us at 3,000 kilometers per hour and will be enveloped in darkness. Just before that, we might expect to see some low contrast uh, shadow bands rippling across the ground. Uh, they may be very hard for the camera to pick up here, but we'll be watching for them, Bill. Yes, we sure will. Well, among a group of people watching the eclipse from their location at the Glenlee Observatory, just uh, south of Winnipeg, is Professor Richard Bachanko, an astronomer at the University of Manitoba, and I think I can get him on the telephone line right now. Professor Bachanko, are you there? Uh, Professor, are you there? We don't have him. Well, we had a, a hope to have a word with uh, Professor Bachanko. I'll tell you, he's uh, one of the most enthusiastic men here in the... Okay, well, he can't talk to me now. Well, we'll get him on the island. He's uh, probably uh, out there working very hard at this point. You know, right I had now. a feeling when we came on the air we wouldn't get him. He's really, really an active man. Well, um, I'd, uh, I'd like to hear more talk about uh, something that we've all been discussing uh, a great deal, and that is the sudden changes that take place when the eclipse occurs. Now, before the eclipse um, uh, actually takes place, there are those uh, shadow bars you talked about. Can they be photographed easily, or are they awkward to pick up? No, they're extremely difficult because of their very, very low contrast. Things do begin to move pretty quickly, too. Uh, we'll be watching all around us for the things that are happening to us. Right now, Bill, it's daytime out here, and even though much of the sun is already gone in the sky, it is definitely daytime. But when we head towards totality, in a few seconds, it's going to go from a kind of a daytime to nighttime. And we'll be able to look up in the sky and hopefully be able to see some of the brightest stars and some of the planets up there as well. Yes, and a lot of changes in, um, in animal life on the planet. So what about some of the things that happen to animals? Well, one of the things that animals do is act as if it's nighttime because they think that it's evening even though it's only for a couple of minutes and very often if you are near a bird feeding station where there's noise, you, uh, you uh, hear them all quieten down. All right. Well, now let's keep score on the various possibilities that you've mentioned here. First of all, I'd like you to meet the fellow who has been uh, very noisy in the background, our friend Erebus the rooster. We're going to keep an eye on Erebus to see if he decides to hit the hay when the sunlight disappears. There he is now, and he's looking wide awake right now. Yeah, you see, he won't talk when we put the camera on him. And uh, we want to know whether plants really close up when darkness falls during totality. Now, this prayer plant that you see here, uh, could very well provide the answer to that uh, question that we've asked. Now, let's uh, talk about the wind. Its velocity at this moment is um, 
Oh, I would suggest about 12 kilometers an hour, would you say? Yes, and we can see the wind direction is switching uh, quite widely, but I think it's generally out of the south right now, Bill. Okay, well, we'll uh, keep a check on that and see if any change occurs during the total eclipse. And at this moment, the temperature is uh, how many degrees? Did you get that just a moment ago? No, I didn't get the temperature. Temperature is now minus 11, the wind south at 15 kilometers an hour. There Excellent. we are, minus 11 south at 15. And we'll see if there's any change in the temperature as the eclipse progresses. But I think before we go any further, we should deal with one very important point right now, Robert, and it's something that's been discussed a great deal, and that is uh, the danger of watching a partial eclipse. What exactly are the dangers involved? Well, the danger is mainly that people are interested in looking at the sun, whereas otherwise they wouldn't. All the rules about safety during an eclipse boil down to one thing. You don't look directly at the sun anytime, whether it's a sunny day or otherwise. You know, the last major eclipse in North America was back in 1970, and the path of totality swept up the eastern seacoast of the United States and into the Canadian Maritimes. And in the U.S., uh, a study was done to find out how people injured themselves. And a very interesting thing came out of that. The, uh, there were many states with uh, people who suffered permanent eye damage, but of all of the states, Calif Californians had the most cases of permanent eye, eye damage, mm -hmm. 23 out of the uh, 145, and California was very far away from the path of totality. Mm -hmm. It's not just those people who live here, it's all the people in North America who need to know that. Well, that was certainly worth mentioning at this time, I think. Now, um, I think we should um, take a look at our Brandon shot again, and it's really moving rapidly in that direction, isn't it? The eclipse is progressing very quickly, and the sun is... Uh, actually beginning to feel a little strange here. Shadows are beginning to look sharper for us. Mm -hmm. well, you've talked about that uh, very often, and we'll get back to that in just a, a short while, Robert. Because it's important to know, I'm going to get back to eye damage here for a few seconds, because it's important to know the consequences of improper viewing of the partial eclipse, one of our reporters, Jim Armit, uh, paid a visit to a Winnipeg optometrist. He was Dr. Bruce Rosner. Dr. Rosner, what happens when a person goes outside and views the eclipse? Where, what happens to the rays as they enter the eye? This is the front of the eye here. The light actually enters from this position here, shines through the cornea, is focused by the cornea, by the lens, and focuses directly on the back part of the eye in this area, the macular area, the fovea being right at the center. And the type of burn that a person will get is just about what you're seeing now. The light is concentrated on a very small area, very minute, but that will affect tremendously the central vision. Your side vision is picked up by the rest of the retina, but that central vision is a very small area right there. And that's where the burn takes place, and uh, following that, not much can be done. About it. That's right. The concentration of uh, the concentration of retinal receptors of nerves is, is extremely high in that area. And uh, that's it. Once you've burnt that area, it does not regenerate. Have you witnessed this uh, in patients? Oh, yes. Yes, we see a number of patients every year. You realize, of course, that uh, a person can have a, a solar burn just by looking at the sun uh, for as little as 10 seconds. You can sustain a, uh, a retinal burn. Um, and the only thing that happens during the eclipse is that you don't have the visible, as much of the visible light dazzling your vision. And therefore, you can look for a longer period of time um, at the sun, thereby allowing the invisible rays, the infrared rays, to actually burn the back of the eye. Well, inexorably, uh, time is counting down towards totality now, that period of something more than two minutes that, uh, that uh, there are so many things to watch for. In that period, we'll look for all of the things that you mentioned, Robert, but um, Bill Morham uh, is very interested in that sort of thing, and uh, he was assigned the task of looking into that uh, aspect of the eclipse, and this is what he found for us. Bill, for someone like myself who had trouble finding the Big Dipper on a clear night, university professor Dr. Richard Bachanko had much to offer. So much so, it's going to be difficult to catch everything that's out there to be seen in the very few minutes it all takes place. But in the few minutes prior to total eclipse, the most obvious thing to look for is that massive black shadow that will be coming out of the southwest and moving across the earth at speeds of something like 2,500 kilometers per hour. During the partial phase, of course, there's still daylight, and day won't actually turn to night until the eclipse becomes total. And it's in these final moments that you get perhaps the most spectacular events, 
one of them the phenomena known as Bailey's beads. Here's Dr. Bachanko to explain. What's happening is the moon is covering the sun, and the moon's limb is the surface of a, an object like the Earth, and it's got mountains and valleys. It's not a smooth edge. So as it moves across the sun and is almost covering the sun, there will be some valleys through which the light can shine, and so you get like a string of beads on a chain. Perhaps, too, sky watchers will be able to notice the activity on the outer rim of the sun. These are gases that are being ejected from the surface of the sun and appearing as undulating bumps on the rim. During total eclipse, then, the experience will be something like walking into a darkened movie theater from bright sunshine. As it passes, once again, that shadow we talked about earlier will be observed as it moves across the Earth to the northeast. But as we said earlier, it's going to be next to impossible for even the trained eye to catch everything firsthand. So I guess the message here is to be selective in what you watch and wait for the instant camera replays. Bill, back to you. Yes, thanks, Bill, very much. I wonder if you can add uh, something to what Bill has said about coronas, Robert. Uh, do they vary a great deal from one uh, total eclipse to another? Well, the corona is, is the most interesting thing. It produces a halo around the, uh, the moon at the time of totality, and it's a very three-dimensional thing. It's rotating with the sun. It's caused by material that's coming out from the sun, so it's constantly changing. Mm -hmm. But uh, there are some general rules about uh, how coronas appear. Uh, sometimes uh, you can have coronas with long streamers in places where things are missing, but it's all seeming to be tied to the sunspot cycle, that uh, cycle that lasts an average of 11 years. Sometimes we see, uh, we see big holes in the coronas, and sometimes we see, um, see streamers, but I expect we're going to have a very globular uh, situation here, and I have some pictures I'd like to show you. Good. I'd like to show you and the audience these pictures, which uh, show various kinds of coronas at different times. Okay. Here's one right there. Now, that, uh, that's a pretty average corona. You can see that there's no place where there's no corona, but you have some very beautiful streamers coming out in all directions. Here we have uh, another one which has a, a place where there's no corona at all. This is the type of thing you'd see when there are no sunspots at all. And here we see a much more uh, globular type of corona, the kind of corona pretty much is the sort of thing I'm expecting to see uh, here today where you don't see any, anything except a sort of a corona that completely surrounds well, the silhouette of the moon. what do you base that on? Is it just kind of a guess? Or? No, not at all. This is our experience. It seems that the, the shape of the corona has some connection with the kind of solar activity. And right okay. now we're heading towards a solar maximum. All right. We'll, we'll have to uh, watch that and wait and see. But uh, we will check it later on, of course. In the meantime, I think we should have a, a flashback right here and another look up top. As we tell you, it was just two days after Christmas when uh, Terry Matty, Manitoba's national national reporter for television did a full report for the national news about the upcoming eclipse. Now that was two months ago and uh, just the other day Brian Koshel talked with Terry and they recall the events that uh, led up to that national news story. I understand Terry it was a tough story to put together made even more difficult by the fact you didn't have one source you could go to to get all the information you needed. That's right the uh, there's no eclipse committee where you can go uh, we started with uh, Robert Ballantyne down at the planetarium and he's a real eclipse freak you know he's seen three or four of them and uh, uh, we went to Arburg to talk to the people there uh, because they were planning their special carnival because we wanted not just a scientific but I wanted other things too. Went to Brandon to talk to Dr. Uh, John Rice the scientific uh, uh, coordinator. Plus, we made a lot of phone calls all, all around the country, really. You got a lot of this information, but you found out that, that it was much of it was conflicting information. That's right. Uh, the experts uh, have never got their act together on this. It's a, it's a big disappointment. Uh, the National Research Council has put out some, uh, some pretty good information, but I found a lot of authorities who you'd expect to know here in Manitoba um, just didn't know what they were talking about. The Optometrist Association put out this pamphlet, which is useful in some respects, but it's riddled with errors. Uh, they say, for example, there's no safe proven way to view the sun directly with any device used directly over the eyes. Well, that's just not true. The Medical Association later said the same thing, and that's why all the kids are being kept in school and watching it on television, which is just uh, nonsense. The, uh, the best uh, information I found out later came from uh, a guy named Dave Moore. I've never met him, but he prepared this pamphlet. He's a local science teacher at the local high school, and he prepared the best summary of all the information I've ever seen, and I wish I had that when I prepared the story. Well, despite your troubles, you put the story together. Let's have a look at it now. Right. 
A total solar eclipse occurs when the moon passes in front of the sun and completely blocks our view of it. The moon casts a rapidly moving shadow on part of the Earth, and temperatures can drop suddenly by as much as 15 degrees. It happens somewhere in the world every year or so, but there hasn't been one in Canada since 1972. Winnipeg will be plunged into darkness for 2 minutes and 16 seconds just before 11 o'clock in the morning. The eclipse will last a bit longer along the center line of the shadow, which runs through Brandon and near Estevan, Saskatchewan. To be able to stand in that pool of darkness which rushes over you at 3,000 kilometers an hour, as it will next February, you have a feeling that you're standing on a moving Earth in a universe of moving bodies. The moon is moving, the shadow of the moon is moving very quickly. You somehow become caught up in the drama of the heavens. About 10,000 people are expected to come to southern Manitoba to view the eclipse because it lasts the longest here, and among accessible areas, the best chance of clear weather is here. The place to be might be the Arburg area, 100 kilometers north of Winnipeg. Here, the sky is often clear. The hotels are already booked solid, people are being billeted in private homes, and the community is planning a weekend of festivities around the eclipse. Some of the events that we have planned are uh, hockey games, broomball tournament, poker derby, figure skating mini carnival, there's a mixed curling bonds spiel on, just, that's just to name a few. Though overcast skies can wreck the view, that possibility is not deterring many amateur astronomers who will go anywhere to see an eclipse. There is a group of people, for example, coming in from Nice, France, a group of about 25 people uh, who are coming in for just two days to see this eclipse. They're coming to western Manitoba in the middle of the winter, investing presumably about $1,000 a piece just to take a chance, a 50-50 chance, about that they can see a total eclipse. For genuine eclipse freaks, the chase can be half the fun. If it's cloudy where they are, they will hop in chartered planes and buses and cars and roar off toward a spot of clear sky. Do you have a traffic jam? Yes, we're somewhat concerned about that possibility. There will be some scientific research, mainly into the sun's outer atmosphere, or corona, which will be visible during the total part of the eclipse. One group from the University of Calgary plans to follow the moon's shadow in a Lear jet. At Red Lake, Ontario, the National Research Council is coordinating the launch of 35 rockets, 19 of them on the day of the eclipse. The unhappy news is that an eclipse can be dangerous. There are always some people who suffer eye damage. It's safe to look at the sun only when it's completely blocked by the moon during the two minutes or so of totality. Before and after, when part of the sun is showing, you can be permanently blinded by looking at the sun. That also applies in areas where there will be only a partial eclipse. Though not all experts agree it's necessary, the Canadian Association of Optometrists says young children who might not follow safety instructions should stay inside and watch the show on television. The event will be broadcast live in Manitoba. For older children and adults, the association is promoting the use of a cardboard device that projects an image of the sun. Another safe way to watch the partial phase of the eclipse is through a number 14 welder's glass. Welding supply shops in southern Manitoba have already sold hundreds of them. Despite the dangers, some astronomers say a total eclipse of the sun is the grandest show in all of nature. Well, it's a little bit like a fireworks display, except more so. There's something very thrilling about seeing all of this happen. And when the light of the sun has returned, I can remember one person describing it as like the first day. Perhaps not everyone will be that impressed, but on February 26, many people will be hoping for a clear sky and for a very good reason. There won't be another total solar eclipse visible from Canada or the United States until the year 2017. Terry Matty, CBC News, Winnipeg. Well, it seems to me, Robert, that when Terry's item appeared on the National Network, uh, his ideas about watching the eclipse uh, matched yours closely, didn't they? I think they did, except that part about calling me an eclipse freak. <laughs> well, I don't know. I think I'd agree with him on that. Oh, would you? I don't think he has to take that back. I can. You're very enthusiastic, and I'm glad you are. It's contagious. Well, There's... I'm sitting here enjoying myself. We are moving along quite quickly. It's interesting if you do compare the Brandon situation with the Winnipeg one. Brandon is a little bit farther along than we are. 
Yes, and that's quite clear there. Well, international cooperation has always uh, been a good policy, and it uh, comes in handy when a total, a total solar eclipse is happening. And today, CBC Manitoba and NBC Washington have an exchange program going on. They're sending us a picture of the, uh, the eclipse that they got at Mount Rainier in Washington, and we're going to feed them a picture of ours when it happens here. Now, this is the site that the NBC cameras captured just a few An seconds ago. Hour, uh, to get to this point, that last crescent of sun still visible in the skies over Portland, Oregon. Uh, and, and as it finally disappears, tell us what we will see and, and what to expect. Well, as that, as that last crescent of, of bright uh, solar disk disappears, just for about five seconds, there'll be a very bright edge, which is called the solar chromosphere. And then after that, you'll see the, the, the pearly, here we're going to see it now. There we are, the pearly outer light of the sun called the corona. Now, on the inside, just by the edge of the sun, you see some, some red points. Those, those are the prominences on, in the solar, inner solar corona solar atmosphere. Give us an idea of the dimensions we're talking about here, of the corona. Well, the sun itself is, uh, eight, is some 800,000 miles in diameter, so that corona, as you can see, goes out at least uh, about a solar diameter, about 800,000 miles out into space. Gases and particles emitted from the sun? Yes, both, uh, both gases and particles, and they're streaming out away from the sun and eventually will impinge on the planets, including the Earth. Well, thank you, NBC. We're going to send you an even better one than that when the time comes, everybody. I am so excited. I've never had a preview of, of an eclipse before <laughs> like that. Here we are sitting uh, thousands of miles away, but Bill, that, that, that shadow of totality was passing them at 8,000 kilometers per hour. It'll be slowed down to 3,000 when it reaches us, but it's coming this hey, way right you. now. All right, well, down through the ages. Solar eclipses have been looked at, they've been marveled at, they've been feared and revered by people in many countries. Two of our CBC staff members, artist Catherine Abel and reporter Bob Preston, have collaborated to look at eclipses down through the centuries, and this is their report. Here it is. The techniques for predicting eclipses were perfected thousands of years ago. Today, space age astronomy has erased much of the wonder and psychological significance that early civilizations attached to them, but for centuries, the ominous shadows guided the fortunes of men and nations. In ancient China, so the story goes, two court astronomers, Si and Ho, were so pleased with themselves for predicting a forthcoming eclipse that they overindulged in rice wine. Unfortunately, they forgot to tell the emperor, who was furious when darkness suddenly descended on the land. He ordered Si and Ho beheaded for endangering the kingdom. An eclipse in 585 B.C. had more positive consequences. In ancient Greece, the Lydians and the Medes, who had been warring for years, laid down their arms and made peace when a total eclipse fell over the battlefield. The English word eclipse comes from this battle. It's derived from the Greek word eclipsen, meaning forsaken, a feeling experienced by the soldiers when the sun vanished. A lunar eclipse in 413 B.C. probably had the greatest impact on the course of history. An Athenian fleet was assembling to attack Syracuse when a total eclipse of the moon took place. The Greek sailors refused to man their ships. Athenian soothsayers advised a 27-day delay to placate the gods. The delay allowed the Syracuse forces to regroup. They attacked the Athenian fleet and destroyed it, and in the process smashed the military might of Athens forever. Old Testament writers such as Amos were not averse to using eclipses as a club for bringing obstinate sinners into line. On that day, says Amos in chapter 8, verse 9, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight, saith the Lord. William Shakespeare's references to eclipses might well have been inspired by current news headlines. In King Lear, he wrote of the dark influences of the shadows on mankind. Love cools, Friendships fall off, brothers divide, in cities mutinies, in countries discord, in palaces treason. Yes, most of the folklore is gone, and more is the pity. The burning issue these days is not the effect of eclipses on man's destiny, but rather if viewing the event will damage his eyesight. Well, I said earlier that we might not be able to get a picture from our Hercules aircraft and the camera aboard it, but uh, what do you know? There it is.
So uh, the technical problem has been overcome. So we're seeing that uh, that picture, Bob. That's being taken high. high they in the have air a beautifully time. steady image up there, don't they? I'm very impressed. Yeah, that is. It hasn't. Uh, there we are. Well, that, that's a little different. That shot somehow. I don't know what's happened there, but it. Uh, the moon's not moving around in the sky. No, no matter where you look at the eclipse, it's taking place. Sure is. Well, we were uh, going to get in touch with our man in Brandon here at this moment, and uh, we'll do that just as soon as possible. Uh, you brought along this welder's glass to give us an opportunity to look at this uh, eclipse as it progresses, the partial eclipse, and I'm going to take a peek now. Have you had a look recently? Yeah, I keep, I keep taking a look to see what's happening, and boy, we're yeah. getting down to a very interesting looking sun up there. Boy, that is something to see. That's a number 14 arc welder's plate, uh, yeah. Bill. Now tell me once again, when the total eclipse happens, we are going to be in, in total darkness here? You mean we won't be able to see our clock? And it's, it's going to get dark. As a matter of fact, uh, we just called downstairs for some flashlights up here because we won't be able to read our notes if we don't have some up here. Wow. So we're a little bit worried about that. About uh, 13 minutes to the eclipse of Brandon. 13 minutes? That's, uh, that's even closer than I thought. And that means that we're, uh, we'll follow that by about four minutes, isn't it? Exactly four minutes after? Uh, I'm not, uh, yeah, we, after the Brandon thing is over, we have a minute and eight seconds before it's uh, total here. One of the interesting aspects of an eclipse is that everybody has a slightly different experience. You can't simply be watching this uh, telecast and think that you can go outside and uh, imagine that you're going to see the same thing that we are right here. Uh, only a few miles away at Steinbach, Manitoba. Uh, totality is only going to last instantaneously. There's our picture from Brandon now. Yo. Mm -hmm. So now we're down to what, about uh, 12, 11, 12 minutes uh, mm -hmm. before totality. Uh, you can't see the moon moving across the sun. It's a little bit like watching the hands on the face of a clock, but look away and look back and it certainly is happening. In fact, it almost is happening too quickly. Yeah, I wonder how much uh, film is being uh, used right now in this province of ours. There must be thousands of dollars worth of film being clicked off. Huh? Yeah, and I'll tell you one thing. The very first time I went to an eclipse, I tried to film it, and it, uh, it's a very frustrating thing because you get no second chance. These heavenly bodies come into alignment and they go on and um, the, the hands of men are not powerful enough to say one more time, please. And I blew the first one. Right. Well, well, today we'll give you another chance to have a look at it. You won't have time to take a picture today. Have lots of help today, Bill. Well, I'd like to uh, turn your mind back to the opening of today's program. You may remember that uh, the opening theme was the 2001 Space Odyssey, a very appropriate selection, we thought. Uh, what you almost certainly didn't know that was that the music was performed by a Winnipeg group, and that is the Silver Heights Collegiate Stage Band. Now we're going to hear that dramatic and familiar music again, and this time we're going to see the band in action as they play once again the Space Odyssey. Here they are. Well, well done, Silver Heights. I don't think that could have been better played. Uh, before we continue with another contribution involving young people, I think we'll take a look at what's going on above us. Uh, Robert, is it possible to feel the same anticipation for this eclipse that you felt for your first one? I know that's a long way back. But can you remember? Oh, I certainly can remember. There's always a, a big difference between eclipses. And the problem is, at the very first one, I thought, as many people do, how can an eclipse be interesting, you know? You hear the moon passes in front of the sun. Well, it's an intellectually interesting thing to find out that all of this happens. It sounds like a cloud passing in front of the sun. And somehow I was caught up in the drama of that. And then I was interested in seeing other things. And that's part of the problem. Uh, when that happens, you... Uh, 
you want to see more. Mm -hmm. I think you will find that things will have happened today that people will say, hey, did you see that, Bill? And you'll say, see what? And they say, well, one of these wonderful things, one of the prominences or the shadow bands or something that we will have missed. And um, you'll say, well, gee whiz, maybe, maybe I'd better go and see another one. <laughs> and that's exactly what I've done again and again. Yeah, so I understand you're already making plans to see the next one. Oh, yes, planning to do that. There, come, there won't be another one in Canada or the United States until uh, well, the next convenient one to, to travel to is 2017. Wow. However, I'm quite willing to go other places in the world. Well, I don't know whether it's my imagination or not, but I feel it's getting darker here right now. Am I it right? is getting yeah. dark, and it's getting dark quite quickly so now. We're uh, down about, uh, I have a light meter here, Bill, and uh, we're down three photographic stops uh, from when we went three. on the air. Three. And we've dropped that last stop in only the last three or four minutes. Let me see. I dropped the last stop uh, since uh, uh, in, in about three minutes, it seems. Mm -hmm. We also have a little bit of cloud, which is confusing things. Yeah, well, if it's uh, getting dark here in Winnipeg, it certainly must be getting uh, dark in Brandon at this moment because they haven't got much... Uh, I'm nothing. sure all the astronomers, both professional and amateur, are gathered around their uh, telescopes and their instruments, and they're all prepared to go. Uh -huh. Well, uh, I know that uh, we uh, have a lot of young people watching this program today, a lot of school children, and I think they'll be very keenly interested in what's coming up now. Uh, when the interest began to build in the total eclipse, we decided to ask one of our reporters here at the CBC to go out and find out what some of the young people were learning about this rather unusual event. Susan Adaskin went to the Lakewood School in the west end of Winnipeg, and uh, while she was there, she visited a class combining grades 4, 5, and 6 in the school, where the teacher was Lorraine Prokopchuk, and here is what Susan discovered. Images of the solar eclipse. These children are translating their ideas onto paper during an art class. For weeks, information about the solar eclipse has been part of their regular curriculum. They saw a show at the planetarium, and they've talked about the eclipse in science, language, math, and even penmanship classes. Brenda, can you tell me what you're drawing there? Describe to me what you're drawing. Well, it's the sun and the way the moon, and it casts the shadow on the earth and the penumbra where it's just partial eclipse, and then where it's really dark around Brandon and Heckle Island and everything. Shane, can you describe to me what you're drawing? Uh, well, that's the sun and that's the moon covering the earth, and that's the umbra there, and that is the penumbra and that's the shadow that um, the moon is making. Well, I'm drawing a serpent, like, eating the sun. Like, like, this is what they thought a long time ago in old China. How did you get the idea for that drawing? Well, I saw the idea in the planetarium when we went there. The sun goes on the moon, and the moon casts a shadow on a spot on the earth. And the sun, sun, the sun's light reflects off the top of the moon, and here's where the the uh, eclipse is just ending. I'm doing the diamond ring, and I have on here the two planets, Mars and Mercury. And can you describe to me exactly what the diamond ring is? When does it occur? It occurs right before totality. Lorraine Prokopchuk says the eclipse offers a rare educational opportunity. It's been fascinating, and it is mind-boggling, some of these things when you're talking about them. But we've been trying to help them through pictures or through, uh, for example, you know, the phases of the moon when the eclipse occurs at a new moon, using projectors and students as Earth and moon, and, you know, visual aids as much as possible to get them to understand this. But they, they seem to grasp just the idea, you know, space is such an in thing to them these days. When you close your eyes and you think in your own mind about the eclipse, what do you see? I think it's going to be very beautiful when I think about it, because it's not very often this, that this one, that the moon covers the, the sun exactly. Well, the uh, countdown to our total eclipse in Brandon is continuing. How many minutes away now? How many about minutes? five minutes away now. About five minutes for the Brandon total eclipse. Uh, two back-to-back -back eclipses in southern Manitoba, the first at Brandon and the second over Winnipeg. Uh, Winnipeg, as I mentioned earlier, for those of you watching in other parts of the country, Winnipeg is about 200 kilometers to the east of Brandon. Well, a few days ago, some uh, important research involving the solar eclipse got underway at Red Lake in northwest Ontario. The National Research Council of Canada and 
NASA, the American Space Agency, are combining their forces in this scientific study. Here is Maureen Mitchells. Bristol is well known for their Black Brant rocket, which pioneered the way for much of Canada's space program. It's a Black Brant 5 that today will carry aloft the largest payload of all the rockets fired during the eclipse. In fact, it's the only Canadian rocket among a field of 34 American rockets that will be launched in the Red Lake area. The payload is actually the cone of the rocket and contains the electronic material for three eclipse experiments. The most important experiment involves a spectrometer that will split the little light visible during totality into colors. In turn, the composition of the outer edge of the sun or corona can be better understood. Usually, this is a difficult task in full sunlight. The rocket will be launched a few minutes before complete totality on the ground. It will be aloft 12 minutes, reaching a maximum height of 130 kilometers. The rocket's special features are a boost guidance system and sensitive fins that balance the rocket in the wind. An attitude control system will set its angle to within a hundredth of a degree at a particular point on the sun. After reaching its maximum height, the rocket coasts into the umbra stage and the main experiment begins. Chances of missing the shadow, about 1%. Still, it's a nervous possibility and timing is crucial. There's only one chance to fire the rocket. Is that we have to ensure that the trajectory of the rocket uh, takes the payload to meet the eclipse at a particular point in time, at a particular altitude, and with the payload pointing at the, at the sun. Now, uh, to try to give some feel for what the problem might be, uh, you imagine trying to hit a target uh, which is traveling at almost twice the speed of sound, 1,600 miles an hour. The shadow is, is racing along the ground, and we have to identify the, the point in time where we launch the rocket such that when, it, when the payload reaches a particular altitude, in this case it's 120 kilometers above the ground, the rocket and the shadow are at exactly the right at the same point in space, and the, the payload then moves down through the, the shadow, collecting its data as it goes. This will be Canada's third Eclipse rocket program in their hopes of solving some of the many mysteries that still remain locked into the sun. Yes. Well, there's Erebus right on cue as we come back. Well, the Brandon eclipse will happen in uh, just a just minute. about a minute right now. They're they're down to uh, to a fine fine bit of sun uh, in the sky. Still dangerous for the people out in Brandon to be looking. Yes, yes, it is. And uh, about four minutes from now, we'll have uh, darkness here in Winnipeg, uh, Bob. Uh, Boy, can you feel it coming right now, Bill? Yeah, I feel what do you chilly. Think? I really do. The the wind has picked up a bit. The the temperature is the same though. I they believe. They say here. it's minus ten, but yeah. I'm sure the wind chill factor has increased. We're now up to uh, from 13 to 17 kilometers and that little bit of difference is making me cold. If I seem to be trembling it's from well, more than just excitement. Take a look at that. We now have a very very fine sliver. We are reaching now what you would call the Bailey's beads. They are seeing out in Brandon the diamond ring and any second now we should see totality from Brandon. Okay, we'll have another look at that in a moment. It's been said that uh, solar eclipses bring about some very strange reactions from people who are watching them. Uh, what kind of strange behavior have you noticed when you've been with people? Uh, I, th have you, right? I think people get, uh, get very, very excited. Incidentally, I am looking out o over to the west now, and it may be my imagination, but it seems to be getting a little darker over there. If you take a look out in that direction, you yeah. might sense a certain amount of darkness already. Yeah, we'll be going back to Brandon and just a jiffy, Robert. They're changing the filters on the camera. I understand, so, yeah, I understand. So it, won't be, it won't be long before we do. Now, you're anxious about your shadow bands. I'm sorry, they're, what did you Oh, say? isn't that a magnificent All right. corona? Is we can it? see, if you take a look at the color picture, Bill, you can see there are prominences, those mountains of, uh, of red around the moon. They are absolutely beautiful. And the corona is, I think, as I said before, very globular in appearance, but streamers coming out in all directions. It must be a breathtaking experience. It's beginning to, to lighten a little bit on the right side, and very soon the eclipse is going to be over there. I can definitely see it getting brighter on the right side of the image right now. The moon is moving across the sun, and their period of totality, which lasts about 2 minutes and uh, 47 seconds, uh, will almost be over. And the shadow will be heading our way very, very quickly. Um, a great Isn't this a wonderful experience, Bill, to be able to see totality just a few miles away? And right now, if you look up in the sky, you'll see that we still have the thin sliver. 
Mm -hmm. All across the province of Manitoba, people are doing different things, but they are all part of this eclipse right now. And you notice that our friend the rooster is a little more vocal right now. He really is. And uh, we weren't... Hear that? Uh, yes, um, uh, it is either being on television that's exciting him, but I think that he probably feel this is the most unusual day. Well, I think we might even get a peek at him pretty soon and, um, and see if he's as excited as the rest of us seem to be here today. All right, here's our Winnipeg uh, shot now. And uh, it is getting a lot darker. And uh, you told me some time ago that uh, it was an eerie sensation. But a total eclipse occurs. It is a, you weren't exaggerating. This is strange, strange. The shadows right now up here on our rooftop studio are extremely sharp. Okay, there's Brandon. So they're still um, enveloped in darkness out there. Huh? Oh, and it's a beautiful eclipse and a beautiful day out there at Brandon. I'm sure the people uh, are, are thrilled. Bill, people have come from all over the world to see this eclipse, and they've come here to see this particular show, and I know they're having a wonderful time out there. They are holding their breath, uh, almost wishing it to last longer. The wind is really begin, beginning to pick up here. You might hear it on the microphone, as a does, matter of fact. Does that ever fail to happen? Can we always count on an increase in the velocity of the wind at this No, time? but I think you can count on a change in the weather. Can you take a look out to the west, too? It certainly there's, seems to be darker. There's the Brandon Diamond Ring. The Diamond Ring is over. and uh, Is it they, over? The diamond ring is, is continuing right now. I'm sure people are using their, their visors right now or whatever technique they have for observing the sun. And we can see the sliver of sunlight is back. And for the people in Brandon, the total eclipse is over. It comes and goes just like that. Now, here's our Winnipeg sky again. Talk yes, about and slivers. we're down to our last minute before totality here. Take a look with, uh, with your welded glass, and you'll see it's just mm -hmm. a tiny sliver. We have exactly 45 seconds to totality. Can you see the way the moon is uh, breaking up? There's a mountain on the moon which has taken a sliver of the sunlight off, and now it's disappearing. That is, in effect, one of Bailey's beads. Well, and there's a look at the light on the ground, too. It's a strange, eerie light out here. And if you look over on the horizon, the horizon is beginning to darken right now as the shadow is sweeping towards us. There is just a little bit of cloud, Bill, and we might be able to see some of the clouds. Bailey's beads are being shown on the screen beautifully right now. It's breaking up the image right now, and here there on the are. studio, it is extremely dark. <laughs> are you there? Are you there? Look at the way the shadow is sweeping over, and look in the sky. Yes, well, you look up something. there. Fantastic. Now, this is the safe time for us to look. This is the safe time to look and just drink it in. Can you see some red spots on the lower left side of the moon, yes, Bill? Yes, I can. Yes, indeed. And this is the time I'd like you to take out your binoculars and take a look at what's up there in the sky. I am absolutely enthralled. There's a beautiful, beautiful red prominence down about 7 o'clock. Oh, boy. There's another one up about 10 o'clock. Magnificent. You know, there's a, a voice in the background. Jacob Donald is in that clear jet high above us. And uh, perhaps some of you uh, watching could hear Jake in the background giving his description of it as well. He's uh, obviously enthralled, and you can't blame him. Would He'll you, be getting a different perspective up I there. would like you just to look around us right now, because if you look around, you'll see the horizon looks like a sunset, a, a yellow glow out in the distance. It's a very, very strange day. And if you look around the city, the lights are on. And up in the sky is that incredible sight. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to see if I can get Jake O'Donnell. Hello, Jake. Uh, are you reading me there? Jake, can you read me? Bill, can I draw your attention to the fact that there is some... Uh, Roger, uh, John. I read you now. Yes. Um, tell us what you can see. How high are you flying right now, Jake? Uh, Angels 4-1. 41,000 feet, Bill. We've just been through totality, and the sun just coming out the other side now. And was it all you expected it would be? Bill, it was a great deal uh, more wonderful. We saw the corona just beautiful there as it was going in. We saw Bailey's beads just perfectly down to the left-hand side. That little bit of stratus below us there, which is about 33,000 feet, turned a vivid pink. The horizon remained a nice azure blue there and a darker blue going right up. Just, uh, just a sight of a lifetime. Uh, a golly gee whiz, uh, Howie Baker. Bill, the Bill. diamond ring. The diamond ring has okay. appeared. It's now on Thanks, stage Jake. Thank you. watch. And for us, the eclipse is over. Now it's back to the shields, right? 
back to the shield. The diamond ring is over. As a matter of fact, around the sun there is a beautiful glow because a little bit of cloud up there, a little bit of haze. And uh, for a moment we got a glimpse of, of, uh, of a halo around the sun just as the diamond ring reappeared. Bailey's bees are back. Wow. And Bill? That was the show. <laughs> that was a show. You know, I felt frustrated there for a moment. I was talking. Yeah. I'm looking around now to see if All right, any... listen. We're going to go to the, the Bel Air camera right now. We're going to see. There we are. Isn't There's the that Bel Air wonderful. shot, 60 kilometers north of Winnipeg, and that's the scene there. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, there's a beautiful, beautiful prominence. It's 7 o'clock. It's absolutely stunning. A great big thing. Uh, it's, an, it's a cloud of active hydrogen, very much bigger than the Earth towering out in space beyond the moon and over on the uh, around three o'clock and uh, around to four five and six o'clock on the uh, the moon we're beginning to see some of the red of the uh, chromosphere the the uh, atmosphere of the sun just above the bright photosphere the bright part that you normally see on the daytime well i think we've seen a, a great many eclipses today and more than we bargained for as I said when we came on the air today, there was some question about seeing an eclipse at all. We were uh, putting all our stock in that Hercules aircraft, but uh, we didn't have to worry about that at all. This has been something else. And you know, Robert, I might say to you that uh, this is everything you promised it would be. A very strange sensation I had when that was happening, and I'm sure many others felt Bill, the same Bel Air is not very far from here, and if you look around to the uh, northwest right now, the sky is much, much darker, still in that direction, so mm -hmm. that the shadow is moving across the province, and uh, for some people, the eclipse is still going on. Bel Air, I see that the uh, photosphere is just reappearing again. The diamond ring is occurring for the people there, and for them, totality is also. You know, I can understand passing. why that, uh, that diamond ring can be such a dangerous thing, because you seem to be lured to it. You want to watch that. And you think the people who didn't know about eye damage, you'd be, you'd be taken right in with that. You, you want to stare at it somehow. Isn't, isn't it hypnotic? Yeah. The whole thing is absolutely fascinating. That's right. I wonder how the young people have reacted watching this in the schools today. Huh? Well, my hope is that they have learned something because it is this kind of an event that puts you in touch with the cosmos. This is the only time that you can, you can feel the motions of the heavenly bodies as they, as they move through space. You can go out night after night and see the, how the moon has moved across the sky that orbits the Earth, but it is at this moment that right. you can feel the motions of the heavenly bodies. I've been sitting next to Robert Ballantyne, who's director of the Manitoba Planetarium. And uh, wh when did you first get uh, excited about looking into the heavens? Were you a small boy at the time? Or? Oh, not at all. As a matter of fact, uh, it, it's very appropriate you should ask that because... You can answer that eclipse. in just a second, if you will. Here is our, our replay of the eclipse uh, over Winnipeg. Oh, this uh, is with our big lens. This and is with our big lens, right. Now, this is something that uh, the primitives couldn't do. No, we can, we can get it really, really close. And, and one of the very beautiful things are, are those uh, very, very bright spots that you see very close to the, to the moon. They're called prominences. You heard me refer to them at the time. They, mm -hmm. looked, they looked red at the time. And uh, they, are, they, are, they are like clouds on the sun, great big jets of active hydrogen. It's a, it's a treat to be able to sit here and uh, reach forward in time and see the eclipse coming and now be able to reach back and uh, grab a little bit of it and, and, and remember it. All right. Now, I was asking you about your interest. And did you say you became interested in this sort of thing uh, as a youngster? Or were you getting No, I, as a youngster, I was interested in astronomy. But it was the kind of thing you read about in books. You know, I knew about the planets and what they were supposed to be made of and the order from the, the sun and that kind of thing. Knew about galaxies. But it wasn't until I, I saw my first eclipse that I really got excited about astronomy. And, well, here I am beside Bill well, Guest. You might have, <laughs> you might have a, a number of applications of the planetarium when this is all over, you know? There might be a lot of people volunteering to get in there with you because it's, uh, it's obviously a very exciting life you lead. Um, this uh, eclipse that is coming next year, the one that you plan to attend in, uh, in Africa, uh, does the atmosphere make any difference? No, it's, it's quite cold where we're watching this today. Does that have any effect on um, the way we see an eclipse? Is it any clearer, do you think, in a cold climate than it might be in a warm one? I think it has a real effect on the drama because uh, the city looked very different from anything I've ever seen. 
at the, at the time of totality before. I think, I think part of the drama, the whole thing, is where you are. Mm -hmm. And I think that's another reason that many people are willing to travel so far, because it's, uh, it's a good excuse to go to some strange and exotic places. The place you go to is not determined by, uh, by uh, where you would like to travel, but where the, the ideal place is to see a total eclipse. Exactly. And exactly. I think a lot of people are going to find out that Manitoba is a very nice place in the winter. Oh, no question about that. We haven't doubted that, any of us. Um, I'm rather anxious to see how uh, some of our um, our uh, roost, I want to know how Erebus reacted. We hope to see a, a playback of what he was up to in just a short while. We'll see whether or not there is any. Well, there's Erebus now. There's a, there's a rooster. And uh, now let's see now how. Okay, I just what, been what told by the director that we're going to see in just a short while a picture of what the city of Winnipeg looked like uh, uh, just as we came out of totality. And that's the reason for the pause. There it is now. Um, that's how our city looked. Isn't that marvelous? See how dark it is. And you can get a sense of, of, that, of that horizon that I was describing, that yellow glow, which is, it's like a sunset, and yet it's unearthly because the sun, of course, is still high in the sky and the lights are on. Yeah, well, that's an automatic contraption. No, it isn't. isn't uh, it? No, because it wouldn't have worked in time. Totality is just too short. What, uh, what they did uh, do was call us at the planetarium and say, look, um, when do we have to turn on the lights in order to have them on at the time of totality? <laughs> and they had to do it for safety reasons. Of course. You know, people are driving around and they don't know about the eclipse. Yeah. Um, uh, you have to have the lights well, on. Well, it's getting back to normal in that picture now, you see. It, yeah. it doesn't really take very long to get back to it. So we're going to have uh, two twilights today then. We'll have another one of those a little later on, won't we? Hmm? It won't be nearly as exciting, Bill. Okay, here's the Winnipeg sky now. This is the way... Yeah, well, that's... Um, how far past are we now, then? About uh, six minutes? Oh, uh, let me see. What, what time did we end? Got to look at my... 47, uh, 50, about 51, I think, wasn't it? Um, uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah. I'm looking it up right now. Uh, 10, 49, 16 it was here. So uh, 49 from 56, that's seven minutes. Right. Well, something we didn't see that uh, you have told me about in some of our earlier chats was the fact that the, um, the other uh, heavenly bodies could be seen quite clearly while that was happening. And I didn't get a chance to scan the sky for those. Well, as a matter of fact, the sky was pretty bright. Uh, neither did I. I missed out on that. You see what I mean, Bill? I didn't look for the planets either. I was looking for shadow bands, and I was quite interested to find that on the snow, where I'd hoped to be able to see some, I saw none, either before or after totality. Some of the people may have seen me gawking around. That's what was I was that a, Was that a disappointment then? Uh, no, it wasn't. Um, I'm... Uh, uh, I'm interested to find that uh, that uh, didn't appear, but that's just part of uh, going to see eclipses. But I meant to look for Mercury because you don't get to see the planet Mercury very often. It's always so close to the sun that it's it's lost in the glare of the sun. You can glimpse it as a uh, as a dim star in the twilight before the sun sets, uh, before the sun uh, rises in the morning or after well, it sets at night. Yeah, you know, Robert, our time is up. And our time is up uh, here in the Winnipeg area. We're going to have a rebroadcast of what we have presented here today. And I hope that those of you watching in other parts of Canada enjoyed this as much as we have. And uh, I guess this is once in a lifetime. We'll not be doing it again. This is Bill Guest in Winnipeg. Thank you for watching Solar Magic along with us. And for Robert Ballantyne, it's uh, goodbye for this time. Bye-bye. <laughs>